Welcome to our podcast, Psychiatric Services from Pages to Practice. In this podcast, we highlight new research or columns published recently in the journal Psychiatric Services. I'm Lisa Dixon, editor of Psychiatric Services, and I'm here with podcast editor and my co-host, Josh Barrison. Hi, Josh. Hi, Lisa. Today, we're going to talk about a really interesting article that described a way to address criminal recidivism and within a mental health residential program. We're very fortunate to have Dr. Daniel Blonigan, who is one of the associate directors at the Health Services Research Center at VA Palo Alto and a clinical associate professor affiliated in the Department of Psychiatry at the Stanford University School of Medicine, here to talk about his paper, Implementation Potential of Moral Recognition Therapy for Criminal Recidivism and Mental Health Residential Programs. So Dr. Blonigan, thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. I think a good place to get started would be just you know, letting us know a little bit about how you found your way into this corner of the, the research world. I think it really starts off from my grad school training. So I'm a clinical psychologist by training and did my graduate work at the University of Minnesota. And where I was there, I spent most of my time doing research on antisocial personality disorder and other forms of, forms of antisocial behavior and substance use. In particular, I actually did a lot of research on psychopathic personality traits and understanding their etiology and development. So it was very kind of a clinical science focused uh, a career on understanding antisocial behavior. And but as I kind of was getting out of, uh, towards the end of my graduate training, I started to get a little bit more, I don't want to say disenchanted with the clinical science perspective, but kind of getting more interested in trying to understand how to make my research as applied as possible. And I was always interested in sort of, you know, what's the best treatments for these behaviors and problems that I found fascinating and what's sort of the, the different treatment services that would be ideal for, for individuals who struggle with criminal justice involvement. But as I got into the grad school and then did my internship at the VA Palo Alto and then eventually a research postdoc fellowship at the Health Services Center where I'm at now, and that's the Center for Innovation to Implementation or CI2I. And when I was there, I sort of, being in a VA setting and doing health services research, I sort of had initially the thought that I probably wouldn't be doing the kind of research I used to do, focused on antisocial behavior or criminal justice behavior. It didn't seem like that was necessarily a, a VA or veteran-focused topic. But then it became known to me, and I became linked with some individuals who run a service in the VA called the Veterans Justice Programs. And this is a service that's actually housed in the VA's Office of Homelessness. And what it is, is that they are a sort of a VA service that tries to identify individuals at various points in the criminal justice system, whether it's individuals who just got arrested or individuals who are going through the court system, or maybe individuals who are in state or federal prisons and are now re-entering uh, into the community. But this service tries to identify individuals who have military history, and so they're, they're veterans, and tries to identify what their medical, mental health, or perhaps psychosocial needs are, and then uh, seeks to try to link them to VA and community-based services to address those needs. And so I uh, became really interested in sort of what sort of uh, work they were doing and what practices they were involved in. And they actually cued me to this intervention called Moral Recognition Therapy, or MRT. Quite a name, I have to say. Yeah, so I can tell you my understanding, but I think it's definitely a name that sticks uh, sticks out uh, when you take note of because it's not a typical uh, name or term for any kind of intervention I've ever uh, learned about. But I was really intrigued by this because apparently it was an intervention that had been around for a couple decades within the correctional literature and as an intervention that's trying to reduce risk for criminal recidivism. So this really uh, interested me. And the VA, this Veterans Justice Program, my partners in that program are really interested in, you know, is this something we should be incorporating in the VA? Because a lot of their justice program specialists were getting trained in MRT, and some of them were doing MRT groups as part of their treatment courts they're involved in. Some of them were even doing it in the VA settings, and they wanted to know, you know, is this something that we should be trying to promote more in the VA for veterans? And so it was actually a it kind of my, made my career come a little bit more full circle. I was able to get back into this criminal justice focused research, but in a you know, more applied health services uh, context in the VA. So it's interesting. I think the kind of common perception or maybe misperception is that there's not a lot of like treatment modalities for what you were studying before, antisocial personality disorder, psychopathy, but criminal recidivism in general, that it's like, what is the treatment that you're actually going to do? This really piqued my interest when I was, was reading because I was like, oh, I was wrong. <laughs> like I had that misperception. There is a treatment. So maybe talk to us a little bit about what moral recognition therapy is, what some of the background is behind it, and, and what the nuts and bolts are. 
It's an intervention developed by a company called the Correctional Counseling Incorporated, CCI, and more specifically, Craig Little and Ken Robinson were the ones who d developed it and been studying it for a couple decades now. But it's an intervention, I mean, in simple terms, if I can put it that way, it's a cognitive behavioral intervention, group-based intervention. And it's based on uh, Lawrence Kohlberg's model of moral development, the idea that as we age, or as we're children, we go through a childhood, the adolescence, and adulthood, we start to sort of increase uh, or go through different stages of moral development where we're initially focused on sort of our own immediate needs. Then we sort of start to get more of a sense of sort of the needs of others that are close to us in the community. And the idea is that the individuals who are cycling through the criminal justice system and are engaging in criminal behavior over and over again, so there's a breakdown in their moral development. That's at least the, the theory behind this um, intervention. And the, and the term itself, as Lisa was mentioning before, recognition is one that I was not familiar with as I came to understand that from the developers, because Ken Robinson, one of the developers of the intervention, was a partner of ours and helped us to um, implement this, this study. He uh, explained to me that uh, conation, I guess, is an old psychoanalytic term that uh, describes the process of conscious moral decision making. And the idea behind moral recognition therapy is that you're sort of trying to help reestablish that process of moral decision making, being people being very mindful of how you make uh, good moral decisions. So uh, that's why the, the, the name came from. But the intervention is I sort of got to know a little bit more. I was really intrigued because it seemed to really hit on what I had always thought would be, if you're gonna have any kind of intervention that's gonna help people reduce their likelihood of criminal recidivism, that this would be structured very similar to this because I think we know in general from mental health treatment literature that cognitive behavioral models work very well in general, not for everything, but for a lot of things that work very well. And this is a very structured where there's a, a workbook that individuals are given and they have a very kind of, I don't wanna say rigid, but very detailed process of how they're supposed to complete the assignments and what they're expected to do to pass the different steps of moral development. So the MRT curriculum involves 12 steps. It's not a 12 step program like AA, uh, mind you, but it does happen to have 12 steps of uh, moral development and individuals have to kind of go through these different homework assignments and exercises in order to pass each step. It's a group based intervention. So you're sort of doing a lot of the work on their own and then they're coming back to the groups and they're presenting their work and explaining, here's how I did this assignment. Here's my understanding of uh, what I need to work on, et cetera. And then the group uh, would decide and vote on if the individual has, has met the criteria for passing that step. And over time, if the individual keeps doing the work and, they, and the steps build on one another, they get to 12 steps and they've completed their journey towards moral development, you could say. But what really intrigued me is that the intervention, a lot of the steps, a lot of the work steps are really helping people try to develop more impulse control delay of gratification, being more planful, not living so much in the moment and being more mindful of the respect of others and how their behavior is impacting others. That intrigued me because I really thought that if you're gonna have any kind of intervention, it's gonna help someone with, I'll say antisocial tendencies, not necessarily personality disorder, not necessarily psychopathy, but someone who's maybe a tendency towards getting involved in the criminal justice system a lot, that impulse control and having a way of sort of helping people develop a way of, of getting more impulse control would be a, a key part of this. So that's kind of what really intrigued me about it. And the fact that it was very structured and it wasn't sort of something that's just um, free flowing and, and people are just not necessarily talking about their crimes or anything like that. Actually, a lot of discussion in the, the groups, the way it works is that people aren't talking about their offenses, they're just talking about their behaviors in general, what they're trying to change. I really liked the, 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 the sort of structured nature of it and the fact that it was also very peer-based where the there's a group facilitator that's trained in MRT that helps to make sure that the groups are run the, according to the protocol, but it's really largely the other individuals in the group who may be at farther along in the MRT curriculum or maybe earlier in the curriculum, but they're sort of providing the feedback and those who are earlier, or I should say rather farther um, in the MRT curriculum, the higher steps really the ones that are help, helping to guide those who are on lower steps about what they need to get, do to get to that next step. And so it's kind of peer mentoring aspect is a big part of it that I believe to be really critical, but we know to be very critical to helping people with substance use disorders. And so I really like that that was a key component of this intervention. I'd like to ask a question that has been on my mind while you've been talking, which is how does MRT kind of connect or avoid a sort of judgmental, not culturally relevant, sort of dogmatic flavor? Because there's a part of this that sounds like this, you know, 
we know the right way to live and this is the right way to live. And if you don't live this way, we're going to put you in a group and have the group tell you how to live. So, so how does it avoid that? Or what is, you know, does that make any sense to you? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. And I think when I first heard of it too, moral recognition therapy, you know, that, that term moral does kind of have a little bit of a judgment quality to it. Not that I'm necessarily suggesting that was the intent of the developers, but definitely sort of does more have this idea of a judgment of what's right and wrong and telling people what, uh, being more directive about morality, when of course that's a very complex uh, subject. You know, the, the steps themselves get a little bit more, I think what I like about it is it doesn't get more into too much it doesn't get into people's crimes at all in, in fact people are not supposed to talk about what they were arrested for or anything like that but more into kind of what are their behaviors and lifestyle currently and is that leading them to the goals that they want so for one example of the steps and one of the assignments that addresses the steps there's part of a step that really tries to get into what are people spending their time and effort towards and ask them to sort of break down all the hours in the week you know what are the different things you're spending your time on and to try to include everything in there. You know, how many hours are you sleeping? How many hours are you eating? How many hours do you spend with family? I mean, and to really lay that out there. And then from there to have people kind of put those in different categories. And sometimes that might fall into things like self-care and sleeping, eating, and then or family stuff or work if someone's employed. But it's an interesting exercise. It helps people really take inventory of what they're spending their time on. And if that is then aligned with what their goals are. Do they want to be, because I think when someone who's actively involved in the criminal justice system, use of alcohol and drugs, of course, is very common. And so having people really being sort of mapping out as precisely as possible, like, well, roughly how many hours do you spend uh, drinking? How many hours do you, have you spent using substances, using drugs, procuring it, and that so forth? And sometimes people are able to sort of say that, wow, I'm spending 20 hours a week in some form on substance use, or I'm spending this much time on myself and I'm spending a, a fraction of my of my time during the week on, on my family. But I, I've been talking all about my family and how important that is to me. That idea is to try to help people give them information and see if it aligns with their goals in a, in a way that's going to try to help them uh, become more motivated or understanding about if their behaviors and how they're spending their time is aligning or maybe not aligning with their with their goals. So that's kind of one way it helps to try to get more into the behaviors, not so much a judgment of of their of their activities. Sounds like this fascinating intervention that's kind of like a mix of psychodynamic, group, cognitive, behavioral, acceptance and commitment there. Like it's just very <laughs> it's very, very interesting, like that this is sort of the intervention that has a lot of evidence around criminal recidivism. This paper is about moral recognition therapy in residential settings. So maybe we can get a little bit more into the paper, talk about why you were looking at residences and what specifically you were looking at here. The setting, this was a key thing when my partners in the Veterans Justice Programs first approached me about wanting to do more research on MRT and, and sort of seeing if it's something that they would find beneficial for the justice-involved veterans they serve question naturally became, well, what setting in the VA or treatment service or service in general should be the home for MRT? What makes sense here? Because up to this point, MRT had really only been studied in correctional settings of some kind or some kind of service that's part of the criminal justice system. So it was actually developed, uh, I think, or first tested in drug-based therapy communities and prisons. And so the, when talking with this with our partners, we're like, it's two questions, you know, what types of populations or treatment settings in the VA are there uh, high proportion of justice involved veterans and then uh what are what's a setting that's going to be really conducive to what is a pretty intensive intervention a long intervention an mrt and and the residential treatment programs substance use mental health residential treatment programs in the va are about three to six months long on average and if you're going to do the full mrt curriculum and you're going to be adhering to it you know six months is is probably a reasonable time frame to try to finish it so the idea is we probably needed a program that's long enough where people can really get a good healthy dose of mrt and a program where they're going to be a relatively captive audience like the original settings of mrt and so those register programs made a lot of sense in that regard and then maybe perhaps more importantly that we just know from the, um, our data in the VA, and I think this is also probably true in a lot of other residential substance use and mental health programs, even outside the VA, that the majority of individuals, patients of the programs, have been in the criminal justice system in multiple times. In fact, some of the research I did uh, in the VA kind of really showed that 
you know, somewhere between 70 to 80 percent of veterans in these registered programs not only have a history of justice involvement, but have three or four criminal offenses on average, and not just for substance use offenses in general, but kind of a range of things. So there's a lot of veterans in these programs that ha have been cycling through the criminal justice system. And a lot of them are being linked there through the justice programs and the VA themselves. So it really felt like this is a, a be a great place to sort of try to see, can we implement MRT and make an impact on uh, this veteran population? If I have it right, there was a parent study that was a randomized controlled trial of MRT. And then this paper was a qualitative study that was looking at some of the barriers and facilitators of MRT. So it, it talked to the participants, a subsample of the participants about what their experience was like to figure out, okay, what made this successful for people who were more engaged? What were some of the challenges for people who are a little bit less engaged? Is that a basic summary? And if so, could you talk a little bit more about who you actually spoke with and what, what sorts of questions you were asking them? Yeah, I think that's a fair summary. So it's uh, the type of design that we use was specifically a hybrid one effectiveness implementation trial design, which is one that, again, I was coming to the VA, I was not familiar with, but I really love the idea. And it seems very practical and common sense to me that you, if you want to study whether something's effective, you should also try to learn at the same time, well, is not just effective, but how would you actually implement it if it was effective? Or if it's not effective, why was that? Almost like doing an autopsy of uh, why a study is effective or not. And because I've only had known of randomized controlled trials of simply being focused, focused on efficacy or effectiveness. But this is the hybrid one is sort of example of a, a, a mix where you're trying to test the effectiveness, you know, randomize people to conditions, test what's effective, but then separately also gather information from the patients who went through the treatment and any other stakeholders who were involved in, it, in implementing it in some way to really understand, did people like it? Did they not like it? What would they like? What did they not like? What was the uh, things that made it easy for people to engage? Or what were the things that made it easy to actually implement and run? So you want the perspective of not just the patients, but also any other stakeholders, the people who ran the groups, the treatment programs who helped incorporate it into their program schedules, the leadership of these programs. Anybody who's involved in the implementation of these programs themselves, we also wanted to interview because we really want to get their perspective on, you know, is this something that they think they would be able to adopt long term or that other programs like them would be able to adopt? Um, and if so, why? Or if not, why? And is it something that's sustainable long term? Is it something that you could easily adopt and kind of let it run on its own? Or is there factors you need to be aware of that would make it harder to be sustained? Um, so our, our listeners aren't able to see how happy you made Lisa by talking about <laughs> the, um, the hybrid model. So, so, so Lisa, because we're on a radio format, what, what, what's, so, what's so appealing about that to you? To me, it's, it's one of the great results of our focusing and paying attention to implementation science, because you, know, you can have all the treatments in the world, but if they don't get out there in the community, they will not help people. And so what the field has learned is that we have to pay attention to how you implement. So this is a beautiful example of a study that's doing two things at the same time. It's testing the effectiveness, but, and, and it was just so well stated by Dr. Blonigan that, that also trying to collect data on just in case this works, we want to know how to do it. And so to me, it's such an important recognition of how research on its own without really paying attention to how we can make it, bring it to people is useless in my opinion. So that's why I was smiling. And I very much agree with that. That was something that just seemed like an intuitive thing that you would want to do because prior to sort of implementation science becoming more in vogue, I guess, or these tri hybrid trials becoming a little bit more common it was sort of the norm to do an RCT, see if something's effective, and if it's effective, then you try to understand the implementation questions, and then that just adds more and more time. But why do it sequentially? Why not uh, collect the information concurrently? What were some of the things that you found? Like, what were some of the barriers? What were some of the facilitators? What did people tell you? We broke down the, the, the interviews or the people we tried to interview from the patient standpoint between those who were high engagers, let's say medium level engagers and low engagers. And the reason for that was that we kind of had learned over the course of the you know, first, about first year of the trial that the patient engagement was much lower than we had hoped for or was ideal for MRT. And so patient engagement seemed to be the big implementation challenge in this trial. And so we wanted to make sure the questions were really, as much of the interview questions were focused on questions of 
patient engagement and we really under, want to understand those both those who engaged a lot and those who just really didn't engage much at all. So we tried to identify uh, individuals and patients who had gone through and received MRT at different levels of how many groups they had, they had, they had entered or that they had, they had completed. I need you to say how fantastic that is because in a lot of studies, you don't have access or you don't pay attention to the people who either you know, dropped out or didn't like it or, you know, and so what, I think is so wonderful about this study is that you very intentionally and were successful at hearing from people who engaged and people who didn't. And that's very, very important for us to, to learn. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, thank you. I think that, that that's something that I felt was a strength uh, in this design as well as making sure we're getting a, a sampling of people across that spectrum there. And I think that was important because we had learned a couple of things that from the different sort of groups you could say is that those who are sort of more medium to high level of uh, non-engagement in MRT groups really talked about, well, it was, they, they were just more internally motivated to do this. Like the reason they were able to stick with MRT is that this, they had sort of the drive and it was important to them. They just were more internally motivated and they kind of recognize that some people don't have that internal motivation. And so that's what was important to them. But by the same token, you know, this is where the staff feedback was, was helpful as well, is that the staff and the leadership that we interviewed from the three programs sort of acknowledged the internal motivation piece, but they also said that, well, it's the, you know, you also need a little bit of external incentives here because a lot of the, you know, interventions like this that are really intensive, you know, if someone doesn't have some sort of external incentive, then uh, sometimes it's hard to get them going. If they can start to get into it and stay with, stick with long enough, maybe they'll develop that internal motivation. But they kind of know that well, MRT doesn't really have anything built into its curriculum that helps the people to kind of nurture and develop that internal motivation. So motivational interviewing, we you know, is, is, is exactly the kind of thing you'd want to do with someone to help them to identify and generate their own motivations, reasons to make certain changes in their life. And MRT doesn't really have that component to it. So we really learned from these individuals we talked to that, that MRT, well, for one, it probably needs some kind of motivational enhancement component to it, but also that if it uh, doesn't have that or maybe concurrent uh, concurrent with that you probably maybe want to have it some kind of external incentive structure like for example maybe it's if not mandated something where it's incentivized from some criminal justice system partner to participate in it at least initially and so that was kind of the interesting thing that we came to realize is that it's not just internal motivation it's also external motivation that you need to have to get the right level of patient engagement in reading some of the the responses that you highlighted in the paper it seemed like mrt's greatest strength is also its greatest barrier, that it's this very intensive program. And so it seems like some of your more uh, like highly engaged clients were like, this is a, a program that is really going to do something. Like this is a real thing. This isn't just, I'm going to a group and we're going to talk. And then, you know, an hour later, I'm going to leave and never think about that again. Like this is a, this is like, real work that we're doing here. But then on the flip side, you can see how if, you're, if you don't have that internal motivation, it's gonna be really, really hard to keep on going for the amount of time to get through all these 12 steps and, and do all that work. Exactly, it, it, and that's the, you know, on the flip side of kind of what is a, we learned from implementation standpoint, in particular a barrier is that it's the, it was really the time intensity of the curriculum that both patients and staff, especially patients talked about as a big reason of why they didn't engage much in MRT. And this is where we heard that a lot from the patients that we interviewed from the kind of the low engagement group that had engaged in three or fewer MRT groups is that instead of they thought MRT was a good program, but they just like, I just, it's just too much time and work because really it requires people to do a lot of the work in between the groups, a lot of these homework assignments and working through the workbook and then going to the groups. And as I mentioned, there's many, many groups, but if you're doing the full MRT, it's probably going to take you six months. And I think for someone who, you know, they have a lot of external incentives or kind of being prompted from a treatment court or their parole office or whatever, that's they're, they're going to do it, but if someone's more residential program and there's not a justice system partner uh, pushing for that, then it's, it's going to take a lot of internal motivation to want to stick with this. And the important thing that I think that I came to appreciate after doing the study was that residential programs, in some respects, might be, a, uh, or I initially thought would be a good setting uh, to implement MRT in the VA, or maybe even outside the VA, those kind of long-term programs might be ideal, but I came to realize that there's probably 
a lot of other, well, there is a lot of other programming that goes on in these, in these treatment programs and a lot of needs and a lot of things that these patients are dealing with, such as a lot of them are were homeless prior to coming to the programs. They don't have housing or they, and they're spending some of their time trying to find housing, find a job, in addition to sort of just dealing with, you know, consulting with family members or, or dealing with substance use issues. All these things that trying to add on intensive intervention like MRT on top of that, it's just not really the highest need for a lot of people unless they're really motivated or they're really kind of really understanding how those things, you know, MRT might be able to help those things I just mentioned. That's what we can appreciate is that the time intensive MRT is difficult for a lot of people and, and for those who are in these kind of programs uh, because there's just so much else they're expected to do. And I should also say, though, that another key thing we learned from the standpoint of facilitation, and this is a big question we asked, we, at least I was very curious about going into the study, was the question of, are the providers in these programs, as well as the patients, are they going to see MRT as being something unique and valuable to them, or are they going to see it as kind of just overlapping or redundant with the kind of groups they're already going to in the residential programs, or the things they're already learning from a treatment standpoint? To address their substance use or mental health issues. That seemed to be a legitimate question because like, there's components of MRT that do overlap with kind of your standard evidence-based practices for substance use and mental health issues. What was really interesting that stuck out to me is that all the patients, not all the patients, but <laughs> the good chunk of the patients we spoke with, even those who didn't engage in MRT, as well as the staff, really felt like it was complementary to the typical programming in these residential programs. What I mean by that is that it's it fits well with other types of programs because a lot of the other treatments in these programs uh, use cognitive behavioral principles or use peer-based models, and MRT has that to it. But complementary in the sense that it's unique. Like the, most of the patients we talked with and the staff said that this is very different than what we do, and it's targeted to helping people break down that kind of cognitive and behavioral chain that led them into a kind of a lifestyle of, of criminal involvement. And we don't have other treatments like that and really is targeting this idea of criminogenic thinking and the correctional treatment literature that they talk about as being a big risk factor for recidivism. That's something that we don't have in these programs. And so they felt that it's very complementary and that this is all the standpoint of the trying to understand is it something that could be adopted longer term in the VA with there be support from it from the, the frontline staff and programs. And the, I think the overwhelming conclusion was that, yeah, if it's effective and you can figure out how to implement it uh, in a way that patients are going to engage with it, that it's, it has value there. So what's the next step? Yeah, so it's a good question. Next step is really trying to understand, well, MRT in its current form, I would say, in this type of setting is probably not going to be sustainable in terms of how you want MRT to be, uh, what it's meant to do. And I say that as that, you know, as a very long, intensive intervention, given everything else that people have to work on in a residential treatment program, that MRT probably can't be in its full form right now. It probably needs to be modified or shortened in some way. And that's, I think, what we need to do more research, actually, is maybe take a step back from the implementation standpoint and realize, okay, we don't need to modify MRT a bit here, create maybe more of a shortened version of it. And that's going to require us to kind of figure out, well, what's the specific steps or components of it that are really core to MRT that are essential? And what sort of things that are maybe less essential that we can uh, possibly could be um, removed just for the sake of having it be more practical and not as long. So I think the next steps are to, and this is what I'm hoping to do with the developers at MRT, who are very supportive of this, but, you know, obviously we're, we're not involved in the data collection or uh, didn't handle the data at all, but it helped us kind of understand how to train our staff and everything and monitor fidelity. But uh, they're very open to sort of talking about making some modifications to MRT, a shorter version, probably adding like a motivational uh, interviewing component to it. And I think what we'd like to do is test out that modified version of MRT to see if it's if as effective as we'd hope, but also to take a step back and try to test it within a, a setting that's a little bit more aligned with how where it was originally tested. So this is where the treatment courts, veterans treatment courts that are um, very common in the country, there's, there's obviously a number of treatment courts that uh, um, are available to, to people, whether they're veterans or not, but the VA's justice programs are very involved in treatment courts. And so I think the next step would be to sort of see if uh, MRT could be more better implemented in those types of settings. And again, modified in some kind of way that would help with the patient engagement challenges. Well, I think we're definitely looking forward to hearing how that goes. And it's a fascinating paper. I, I learned about a whole new modality. And also, it, you know, I think as Lisa was saying, it's a real example of how, you know, the implementation and the, the effectiveness are really kind of feeding back on each other 
you can find something that works and that's able to be implemented uh, on a wider scale. So we'll have you back when the next steps come out. Yeah, thank you so much. My pleasure. It's really been a pleasure talking with you both. Thank you for having me. That was really thought provoking. And Josh, I'm so glad that you chose to focus on this particular article. It really matters. So we're done for the day. We invite you to visit our website, ps.psychiatryonline.org to read the article we discussed in this episode, as well as other great research. We also welcome your feedback. Please email us at psjournal at psych.org. You can also rate and review the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to it. I'm Lisa Dixon. I'm Josh Bearson. Thank you for listening. We'll talk to you next time. APA Publishing has other podcasts you can listen to. AJP Audio is the podcast for the American Journal of Psychiatry, hosted by Aaron Van Dorn. Psychiatry Unbound is the books podcast from APA Publishing, hosted by Dr. Laura Roberts, editor-in-chief of APA Books. Check out these and others, along with APA's newest podcast, Mentally Healthy Nation, at psychiatryonline.org slash podcasts, or you can subscribe via Apple, Google, Spotify, or wherever you find podcasts.